This is Kevin Harrington, original shark from Shark Tank, inventor of the infomercial, and you're listening to Jamie Beckler from Success is a Choice. Providing insights to help you grow your business, improve yourself, and add value to those around you. You're listening to the Success is a Choice podcast, where you get a peek into the lives of industry leaders as they share their stories with you. Welcome to Success is a Choice podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Beckler. And today we have Mark Fowser joining us. Mark was an actor, writer, and director out in Hollywood. Some of the shows that he appeared on were Evening Shade, Jag, Coach, and Quantum Leap. Some of his movie credits included Madison and Waking Up Reno. He was a writer for Miramax before moving to Marion, Indiana in the early 2000s. Since being in Marion, he has been the city's director of marketing, the executive director of the Community School of the Arts, and the creative development director for Marion Community Schools. It is our pleasure to have Mark Fowser on the show today. Mark, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here, buddy. Thank you. I gave the audience a, a, a rundown of some of the things that you've done, but kind of share some more details about your journey. Tell us a little bit more about your background, how you got to where you're at right now. Okay. Well, I was, uh, I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and I think um, my parents had a bad divorce, and I, I always tried to make them laugh any chance I could to give levity, so I was kind of a class clown. And uh, in high school, I did a talent show, and everybody was going, you got to do this, you got to do this. And I thought, yeah, I'd like it, but I don't know if it's meant for me or not. And then in college, I had someone pull me in and do a play, and I really liked it. And from there, I started doing tons of plays at, at the University of Missouri. And then after that, um, I got uh, into the Burt Reynolds School of Theater Training, which uh, is a really cool thing that Burt Reynolds did at the height of his career. And he takes 12 people from around the country. And so I, I went there, and I got paid to go there. And then I got um, uh, met my wife there, and we moved out to L.A. We didn't even have – we got married and didn't even have a honeymoon and went right out to L.A. And I was – you know, struggled like everybody else and did every odd job you could. And then I was really blessed, and I got to write on Burt Reynolds' show on Evening Shade. I was his personal assistant for a while, and I was acting on Sequest, and then there was a bad earthquake in 1994, and Evening Shade got canceled, and Sequest recast, and my wife said, I'm out of here, baby. So she wanted to go back to her hometown, which was Marion, Indiana, and I thought, well, I, I've lost two jobs. I don't want to lose my wife and family. So I decided to come back to Mary and not knowing what I was going to do. And the night before I left, I was acting on a TV show called Coach. And I got a call at Universal Studios. I sold my first movie. So um, then I went to Marion, and I started writing more movies. And uh, actually, I was doing better in Hollywood living in Marion than I did when I was in Hollywood. So it was kind of interesting. And then... Um, and other things happened. I, I got a little jaded by Hollywood and had some money and wanted to help the community I live in. So I helped build the Community School of the Arts. And, um, and where I met you was at Marion Community Schools because I'm helping Marion Community Schools. Now, you mentioned uh, Burt Reynolds. Uh, you still have. It's, it's been a lifelong friendship with him. Talk a little bit about Burt Reynolds and, and your time with him. Yeah, he is a, just an incredible class act. Uh, again, at the height of his career, he could have just, you know, taken care of himself. And what he did is he built a big theater down in his hometown of Jupiter, Florida. And he created an opportunity for people like me who, um, I, and he gave you a full scale view of what this profession was like. So, you know, we would work and, on a show and then maybe go on his yacht, and then the next day we would be at the city dump taking down a set. And then we would be, um, you know, going to his house to watch a movie and and having an acting class with Dom DeLuise, but the next day we would be cha cleaning Dom DeLuise's toilet. So he gave you that full-scale version of the ups and downs of Hollywood. And, you know, when I was in L.A., I didn't hear from him a lot, and I felt like, well, you know, he's done enough for me. Why should I? And then one day he called me and said, uh, I have an idea for you a, on the show if you want to act on it. So I had audition like everybody else, and I got it, which was nice. And from there, he just asked me to be uh, his assistant. And then I was on the show for four years. 
and boy, did he teach me a lot there. Uh, from anywhere from we'd be in the editing room at three o'clock at night, and we would go. Uh, he just taught me so much as a friend, a teacher, a mentor, and uh, as you said, we're, we're friends to this day. I see him every March when I go down there. Great guy, and he came to Marion for me. We did a show here, and he was nice enough to come here. And boy, that really was special for the community. Yeah, that would that's big time for uh, that was the community school of arts, correct? Right, right. Yeah. So, talk to us about uh, your uh, your work with that, and uh, you know how that came about, and uh, you know some of the great accomplishments that uh, the community school of arts has uh, has done through the years. Yeah, well, you know, I, like I said, I, I was working quite a bit um, living in Marion, uh, but working in Hollywood. But I was getting to the point where they wanted me to write movies I didn't want to write anymore. And um, I coached my kids' little league team, but I, here I'm living in this community, and I didn't think I was going to stay, but I'm now I'm here long enough, and I feel like i got to do something to, to give back because I haven't really done anything. And so I was asked to help this um, organization, a not-for-profit called the Community School of the Arts. It was in the basement of a church, and we they taught like six classes, and there was no money, no executive director, and the church was getting ready to close, which meant the school was not going to have a home. So I just took a year off uh, of work and just helped build it, and I just got every community person I could to help um, Billy Bob Thornton was nice enough to do a commercial for me, and Jim Caviezel and and Kelly Ripa and several people to bring attention to this little engine that could. And I brought stars to town, and again, it was it was a total team effort where we had a lot of great people working to build this up. And um, by the time I left, 12 years later, um, it well, I'll go back a little bit. After year one, and I was working about 60, 80 hours because I wanted to. Everything I do, I do because I'm passionate about it. I, it's, it's not work for me if I love what I do. But at the end of the year, I had to get back to work. And my fellow board member said, hey, look, if, if you quit, we're going to go backwards. Would you be the executive director? And we have $12,000 to give you. And he looked at me really funny, but, you know, you can't feed a family of four at the time I had or uh, on $12,000. But we didn't have $12,000 to give me. And that was basically their way of saying, build it and they'll come. And it was one of those field of dream moments. So I, I took the challenge. And then springing 12 years later, when I left, it had two 18,000 square foot buildings downtown. It was debt free. It had hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, and it had $125,000 a year in scholarship and endowment. So I felt like I left it a lot better than I found it. It was pretty neat. Absolutely, and it's still going strong, which is a testament to you know a legacy that you leave. So great job with that. A lot of people have been impacted with that. And, and speaking of other impact, you know you you've moved on. In the last few years, you've been working with Marion Community Schools there as their marketing and creative development director. And, you know, for those people that don't know, Marion, Marion historically has a very strong athletic program. They're known statewide and in some cases for basketball nationally. But they fell on hard times economically through the years, the last few decades. And so you came in and kind of did some rebranding and, and got some people excited and raised some money. Talk a little bit about the things that you did to help put Marion back on the map. Well, I think, I, you know, you started the same time I did there, and, and uh, you, you did some digging, and you realized how financially poor the athletic department was. So as you stated, we lost a lot of manufacturing in this community. So that's one of the miracles of the Community School of the Arts is how could you build it in one of the United States' worst economic times. But same dilemma with Mary Community Schools. I mean, it was actually on state takeover uh, probation. And I think from the top down, everybody kind of assembled and said, let's, let's do this. And um, I think a credit to you is you could have been really selfish and look for the now, which most people do, but you look long-term for the future of what was important because you didn't want an athletic director to face the same issues you had to deal with. So you helped me build three endowments. 
and that's over now it's over two hundred thousand dollars. So when you think about a school that was founded in eighteen ninety one and has no um, no you know in in the eighties they were flourishing in the seventies financially just killing it. Um, but now they're on economic hard times. Uh, it needed a visionary like you, and I'd like to think myself to help create those endowments, which are going really strong and helping helping a lot. And and as you said, we rebranded all the schools, so we, you know, every grade school, every junior high was called something. You know, was it the Kendall Colts or the Riverview Rockets? And we just felt like there wasn't a a brand loyalty to that. So we made everybody what the high school is, is Giants. And our colors were purple and gold. And one of the neatest achievements was is our enrollment has every year been down since the 70s. And when you lose enrollment, you're losing money. And um, last year was the first year since the 70s our enrollment went up. So that was a huge accomplishment. Yeah, and you put together uh, a lot of videos, actual commercials that ran on TV. You put different posters, banners around town. You did a lot to help create a sense of pride, you know, bring back kind of that giant pride that they did have in the 70s and the 80s. And talk a little bit about the specific things that you did, uh, some of the windscreens, some of the things to bring back that pride. Well, the the windscreens was an idea, like I said, as an athletic director, you could have taken the money, but I thought, thought it was a great way of, one, showing that we had support from the community, from all the businesses and alumni that wanted to donate money. But uh, we, we put it in the endowment, which is what helps everything grow in perpetuity. So that was one thing. We were able to get uh, old legends, you know, in Indiana – that's basically the basketball capital of the world. And when you have Marion High School as the most state championships, um, and you have people like Zach Randolph who went to Marion and all these incredible players, they're all kind of like a family and a fraternity, and they all were willing to do a video for us. And so we had a great donor who bought us projectors. And and so now before every game, and, and we have one of the largest high school arenas in the world, So when you pack a house like that, you're talking about 7,000 people um, that are watching these videos, and then you put them on YouTube, and people are going nuts over it. So it's important that we uh, bring the past and and honor the past to help us build the present. Uh, The the past is so important to us, a lot of times people – don't honor the past. And so the recent thing we just did there was uh, the Giant Athletic Hall of Fame. It was a huge undertaking. But again, it was a way to inspire a community and inspire kids to see, wow, that person went here and they went to Division One and they were professional athletes. And so you see different people's journey um, from Marion High School all the way to a professional ranking. Or, you know, we've had Olympians, we've had professional football players, uh, one of the best bowlers in the world. We have had four professional golfers. So we turn out quite a bit. Yeah, and it was a great opportunity to really, like you said, to help the present to understand the past and so that you could move forward in the future as well. And and a lot of times, you know, people feel good about themselves. They feel good about them schools, their school, and, and they start playing better, but also maybe maybe that motivates them to stay in school. Maybe that motivates them to be better members of the community one day. And, and you didn't just, you know, focus on basketball. You know, you did a lot with tennis, did a lot with all the sports, soccer. It, it, it could go on down the line. But you also, you talk about these endowments. The endowment wasn't just for athletics. The endowment was for academics. It was for the arts as well. And so there was a lot of things about Marion that people didn't know. You know, a, a lot of a lot of the top academic people were coming out of Marion. Uh, a lot of the great performances, theater performances and arts. Talk a, l- a little bit about the non-athletic stuff as well. Yeah, well, like, you know, Dave Linegar, the founder of Remax, he's a billionaire, you know, and he went to Marion, a 1963 graduate. And so, you know, I read an article about him. He says, the one thing I wish I had was was a yearbook from 1963. And so I got one for him, and he writes me back. And so, you know, it's important to have those relationships with that. Um, uh, you know, you have the Moorhead family who went there. They're the largest Verizon retailers in the in the country. 
Um, academically, Marion is incredible in the fact that kids that want to succeed can leave Marion High School and go to Purdue University or virtually any university and be a junior because they have college credits in high school, which is really neat. And as far as the arts are concerned, um, there are, you know, Jim and Bob Walton, they're on Broadway, and uh, Caleb Marshall is one of my students at CSA, and, and some people know him as a fitness marshal, but he's a YouTube sensation, and he's just killing it out there. And um, they, they have a beautiful theater. I mean, the theater is so nice there. Um, it's really nicer than the one I had at the University of Missouri. Um, and that just goes to show you the people from Marion. If there's passion and there is goodwill and hard work, the, the people will deliver for you. I hope that you are enjoying this conversation with Mark Fowser. He's an interesting guy who is giving back to his community. He has helped impact so many young people, both in the arts and in athletics. Frederick Douglass once said, it is easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. In the same way Mark is trying to bring a little more sunshine into the world, we wrote a book called The Leadership Playbook, Become Your Team's Most Valuable Leader. It is packed full of practical insights and stories to help kids become better leaders. When we help develop today's students, we can also help influence the future. So please visit theleadershipplaybook.com to learn more about this impactful book. And now back to more insights from Mark Fowser. Well, the uh, title of this podcast is Success is a Choice. And, you know, when you went to Marion Community Schools, you know, there wasn't a lot of money. There wasn't as much pride as there was in previous decades. Uh, still, certainly there was passion. Certainly there was people, you know, uh, people that had pride. But overall, you know, it was a little bit down. And you went in and, and you know, along with a team of people, you chose to kind of rebrand, to move us forward and to say, listen, it's not going to be easy, but we can do this. We can bring Marion back. Talk a little bit about the struggles. Talk a little bit about the choices, you know, day to day, you know, why you would want to even invest in that when it seems like maybe it's not going to be as easy, but it's, it, it's going to be worth it. That's a great question. You know, um, it, to me, it was a total God thing. It's like, why would you build an ark? You know, if, you, if you're if you in tune with God, you do what you're told to do. And if you do, you'll be richer than you've ever known. And for me, it would have been a lot easier to just go somewhere else. Um, because in my profession as a writer, I didn't need to be here. Um, and what I saw is such character and such need for hope here that it was worth fighting for. It, it, as I said, this town is a small manufacturing company that lost its manufacturing, so it needed a new identity. Um, f for those of the, the people that are listening, Marion is where James Dean was born. It's where uh, the creator of Garfield was born. There's tremendous talent that's come from Marion, but you've got to try to tell those stories to kids so that they feel like if it happened before lightning can strike again, and maybe it will happen to these kids. And I think that was my um, um, that was my real passion is to try to get people's mindsets to, to change, because you have to do that if you want to win. You got to change your culture. You got to change your mindset. And anybody can do it. That's the beauty of it. And you just got to start believing. And sometimes you do it through visuals uh, that you remind people uh, daily. Wow. That's what we did with the Community School of the Arts. If you see the building on the side, if you look it up online, you'll see a large image of James Dean and several of the great artists that came from Marion. Um, and even Cole Porter, who lived in Peru, would take a train to come to Marion to take music lessons. And if you don't tell those stories, you're not really inspiring your kids. You're not doing your job. So that's kind of what was my motivating factor of um, you know, it, it reminds me even of when I was at the University of Missouri. I could have been in the really cool fraternity house where it was easy, but I want where I liked the, the people and, and, and saw and could cast a vision and go where we wanted to go with it. And um, to me, that's more of a challenge. And, 
And so to see a, a fraternity that I was in not doing well, and by the end, you know, being one in sports, academics, uh, Greek week we would win. It was just really rewarding. And so that's the beauty of, of life choices is you, you, you find the right fit and then you, you make winners around with everybody you have on your team. So you mean the fraternity that you were in wasn't the cool fraternity? You didn't make it the cool it, fraternity? Oh, yeah, we totally did. No, okay. You know, here's a cool story, okay? We were not a cool fraternity by the perception. Nobody would do a Greek week or homecoming with us, and, and we, we didn't win sports. And then the following year, second year I was there, we won this softball championship. We won homecoming. We did Greek week. And there was a thing that they had called fling and sing. And this is one of the neatest things. And everybody did sing. I thought, you know, I want to do this fling thing where I want us to act, sing, dance. I'll write a script. I want sets. I want everything. And without the help of 60 guys on my fraternity and 60 gals from the Kyle house, we couldn't have done it. But we all worked together. We did it. And we changed the face of it forever. And literally it is so rewarding to go back and know that there's no thing anymore. All it is is fling. And all these kids are getting a taste of the arts like I did. So the second year, we, after we won the first year and changed the game, the second year I was the host. And I gave the Best Actor Award to Brad Pitt, who went, I went to school with, and Sheryl Crow was in the band. And so that's kind of cool to, to know that when you're in school, uh, you never know who's standing next to you and just striving for excellence, you know, and, and getting to that next level. And it was, it was so rewarding back then to do that. I, I loved it. Yeah, the University of Missouri has had quite a few people from the arts and film that have come out of there. Yeah, you mentioned a couple with their Sheryl Crow and, and Brad Pitt, so that must have been fun. Oh, it was, it was so much fun. They were, they were great then, and they're doing great now, so I'm really proud of them. Well, you are, uh, you're talking to me while you're in your home office, and I've seen your home <laughs> office. Tell the listeners yeah. a little bit. Give them a, a picture of what your home office looks like, because a lot of people don't like going to the office, but you have pretty interesting office to go to. I do. I do. I love it. Um, I, I built a neat office over my three-car garage, and I love action figures. So I have like a whole display of NFL legends on one side. I've got Marvel, Marvel and DC images. I've got uh, figures. I mean, I've got Star Trek and Star Wars in an area. I've got WWE in an area. I've got basketball in another area, hockey in another area. So uh, it's it's pretty packed. I got monsters and movie characters. So it's it's pretty uh, wall to wall. There's a definite sickness. <laughs> All right, Mark. A couple more questions as we as we wrap up here. Some some rapid fire. Some uh, some questions for you. If you could uh, meet somebody or get to know somebody that you don't already know, who would that be? Uh, I don't know. Maybe Ric Flair. <laughs> <laughs> you are a big. Uh, Ric I think Flair it would be fun to hang with him for a day. Or I, I and I met Bill Murray, but boy, I love to hang with Bill Murray. He's fun. Bill Murray, though, is a uh, Chicago Cubs fan. I know, I, and I try to convert him, but there's no way. And you're so. a big St. Louis Cardinals fan. They're big, yes. What is a purchase of a hundred dollars or less that had a profound impact on your life? On my action figures. Well, you know, you, you just missed out on your opportunity. You could have said your first date with your wife. Well, but you that might have been more than a hundred spender. Yeah, you're a big spender. That's right. So your action figure. Yeah. What is your favorite action figure that you have? Um, I had a custom made Jack Youngblood. He's my favorite football player. I think that's my favorite. So are you liking the uh, L.A. Rams right now? You know, I'm not into football right now um, due to a lot of reasons. I'm I'm disappointed in the fact that they move and they're you know all these teams are moving. I think the greed is getting out of hand. The concussion thing's a real problem. Uh, the kneeling and protesting is not doing great, and you can't celebrate, but you can. It's just it's a mess right now. I need to go. I, they need to hire me. I won't take as much as Goodell, but I'll fix it. If you were to be on a reality show, what one would it be? 
Uh, probably Shark Tank. Would is you, that a reality show? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. Yeah, I probably would be on that. I think it'd be fun to pitch on there. And don't ask me what, because I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried to pitch an idea before? Have you had an idea that uh, you've tried to bring to market? Well, not, not in that form, but, you know, that's how I would sell movies is I, I had to pitch them. So I did that all the time. It was really a fascinating process where you'd pitch movies. You know, like the movie Masterminds that's out with Zach Galifianakis. I was the original writer on that, and we pitched it. How cutthroat is that business? How tough is that? It's really tough. I mean, it's, it's a real tough business, but, um, you know, for me, it was incredibly rewarding, and uh, I, I wouldn't... I, I would do it all over again, and I still might. I mean, I'm working on a musical about James Dean right now. So I'm going to always continue to write and continue to do things. But it, it's 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 very hard job to – it's kind of feast or famine. And, it, and, it's, and they, and they kind of go with what's hot right now in their mind. There's like a wave that happens. I'll, I'll give your listeners an example real quick. Um, Billy Bob Thornton. Before he was Billy Bob Thornton, I was friends with him, and um, he was just about to come out with Sling Blade, and he goes, I got this idea about writing the redneck version of Bob Carroll, Ted, and Alice, and if you want to write it, he goes, I, I think I can sell it, and I, I could write redneck all day long. So I did it and gave it to him, and he goes, yeah, I think I can sell it, and then Sling Blade comes out, and because he was affiliated with it, we got on this giant wave of success, and that's kind of how Hollywood works. When Burt Reynolds was up, I was up. When he was down, I I was irrelevant. And and that's kind of how LA works. And if you can handle that, then you'll be fine. I mean, the whole industry has changed while I was there. It, and it's all all about marketing. And if there's a marketable book that's sold, they'll be making that movie in all likelihood. But that that's where the industry is going. There's you're not gonna see movies like Sling Blade as much anymore because they wanna do Avengers and Star Wars and Star Trek and all the all the the franchisees and any bestsellers or the Kardashians, you know. All the important stuff in life. <laughs> wink wink. <laughs> Other than your current job or, or what you're currently doing, you know, writing movies, what, is there something you would love to do if you could do it? I know it sounds really crazy. I would love to be, um, I would, I'd love to make action figures. I'd love to work for a company where I could be a part of that. That would be really neat. But I'd also like to work for the St. Louis Cardinals um, in some form. Um, I, lo I love the Cardinals. I, I would have loved to have been a broadcaster, but one, I don't have a great voice, and two, with our political climate, you know, you say one thing wrong and you're toast. So I, uh, that was what I originally wanted to do, though, because I love sports so much. Okay. What is a, a favorite quote that you have? Who loves you, baby? <laughs> <laughs> you do like that one, huh? I do. I do, because it's really important for people to know they're loved, and it, it, it's important. Well, I've seen your passion close at hand, and, and uh, I really can vouch for you and, and how much enthusiasm you have and how much you give of yourself to uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing. You mentioned you'd like to jump you know, feet first into something, and, and you've done that. You, know, you, you came into a community, and, and you kind of invested in it and took ownership in it and, uh, and planted your stake, so to speak. So... Uh, I definitely have seen that passion. Is there a place that people can go to find out more about you or to connect with you? Uh, MarkBowser.com. I, I wish I would keep it up more, but um, it's my website, and I need I need to probably look at it a little more, but they can get a hold of me through that. And um, I'm, I'm kind of a Facebook junkie, so if, if they want to be my Facebook friend, <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> My son, on our last visit to Grandpa's house, discovered Smokey and the Bandit with Burt Reynolds. Yeah. And he loves himself some Smokey and the Bandit. He's eight years old now, but he loves himself some Smokey and the Bandit. He's you sweet. Wanna, you want to end this with, with some story from about Burt Reynolds? Oh, boy. Um, okay, I'll tell you a fun one. Um, you know, it, movies, he improvised a lot. In television, it's completely different. In television, it's it, it's run by the writers because you every week and there's an 
arc every year, and you know, so it's important to honor what the writers write. And Bert's a team player, so he wanted to do it. But the turnaround time, sometimes he would get the script like two days before we had to shoot it. So he quietly came up with a device that he would put in his ear, and I would read him lines, his lines, while, let's say, Mary Lou Henner or someone else is talking. So we would rehearse it that way. And then in the show, if he needed it, I'd always have it there for him. So it was just a safety. He, he knew his stuff, but we did it as a safety. And if he didn't hear me, he would grab his nose. He would pinch his nose. And I would have to repeat. Well, one time they were doing this scene with Mary Lou Henner, and I turned the page to give him his line, and I give it to him, and she stares at him funny. And so he pinches his nose like, you've got to give it to me again. I might And I gave it to him again. And she goes, you skipped the page. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally turned two pages, so... Um, he, he has such a great sense of humor. I owe him so much. Great, really fun guy, you know. Now, were you giving him the lines in Smoking the Bandit, all those nice, uh, sweet-talking lines to Sally Field? No, no. He, he probably did that all on his own. All right. He, he, he did that all on his own. Uh, you know, I'll tell you something. Burt Reynolds, really, as a, as a kid growing up, was the reason I wanted to get into show business. Because uh, you'd look at this really good-looking guy who made all this money, and he, he had fun, and he had a whole great team of people he was very loyal to that he had employed. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And then I was so blessed to work with him and see him. But I will tell you, um, it wasn't him, but it was being a star is what scared me from the business. So I got to learn why one should not worship fame because it, it's a tremendous cost that nobody has any understanding of until you see it up close and personal and it was really educational for me and extremely frightening well i, th I thank you for your time today mark and know you're busy so i appreciate your time and, and for joining us and giving us some insights you got it baby woo, woo, woo. mark fowser is one of the most enthusiastic and positive people i've ever met I hope that you enjoyed this interview today as much as I did. I enjoyed talking with him. I enjoyed the conversation. He always is upbeat and always is looking to help out other people. So thanks so much for tuning into the show today. Remember that you can get a free audiobook download and 30-day trial membership by visiting audibletrial.com slash success is a choice. Also, if you haven't yet done so, please take just a quick second to hit that little subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Thanks so much, and until next time, remember that success is a choice. What choice will you make today?